all of the other sports are starting to pick it up too. You know, the 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 snow skiers, the snow ski jumpers, hockey's starting to recognize it as well. It's coming down into the junior sports levels, the the children in high school, college. Football is huge, soccer, you know, so the awareness is out there. And now with this loss of Craig Llewelland, um, I think water skiing has finally decided to acknowledge that it exists and that it could be a problem for our athletes. And we don't want them to suffer any permanent complications or permanent brain problems without knowing the risks involved. And so that's what the committee was, in, was hoping to do. What's up, what's up everyone, welcome back or welcome to the Wariski Podcast. This is Matteo Luzzeri, your host. And the goal of this podcast is to promote water skiing. Now, this podcast plans to promote water skiing weekly, but uh, fortunately, let's say, uh, we've been very busy here at our ski school at Jolly Ski to the point that I really didn't have a whole lot of energy to dedicate to podcasting. So sorry for the little break, but... Uh, I am very excited to release this episode just because it's so rich of information and history that I think hopefully it will make up for the two weeks break that I had. So this episode is with Bruce Reed. Bruce Reed is a former world championship medalist, a longtime Canadian water ski team member and pro tour skier, and he is a orthopedic surgeon. Now, I got in touch with him back in October, or should I say I got to know him back in October, when I joined a work group within the IWWF Medical Committee that really wanted to um, press on with the issue of concussions in toad water sports. Um, You might be familiar with it. Concussions are brain injuries and the awareness and recognition of these such injuries has become prem, uh, preeminent in a lot of sports, a lot of professional sports. Um, some of you may be familiar with more impact sports like um, fighting, football, American football, um, ice hockey, driving sports. But um, it is a, an issue that permeates a lot of sports. And oftentimes the issue is lack of education and awareness about it, which tends to lead to lack of recognition of these injuries. And so Bruce led this work group within the IWWF Medical Committee um, and through various Zoom meetings and and collaborative work, I I, I got to know him a little bit uh, more on the professional side, but I I was really eager to hear his story. I, I could tell in... In, in working with him, that uh, his passion for water skiing was deeply rooted. And so I'm glad I got a chance to hear his story. But we also talk a lot about um, the work that we've done within that work group. And um, I just hope this is one of the ways in which my listeners will get to know about concussions and become more aware of them. And hopefully help someone, you know, who might have had a concussion or might have, uh, or there is suspect, suspicion of a concussion to get the proper help because um, the damage uh, later on that a concussion that goes unnoticed or undetected or even more so multiple concussions, um, the damage that, that it can lead can be very severe. So lots of information in this episode. I, I really hope you'll enjoy and you'll, you'll get to know more about, about this and, and at least be more aware of this potential injury that can occur in our sport too. Before we jump on the episode, I just want you to know that the podcast is brought to you by the Flowpoint Method. 
The Flowpoint Method is the online water ski training program that you probably have heard about and saw, seen videos about uh, that was developed by Jenny Lebeau and Marcus Brown. Uh, technique, nutrition, mindset, fitness, uh, they truly have a holistic approach for people who are committed to take their skin to the next level. Um, one of the things that I love about the program, which I am part of, is the uh, Zoom meetings with the members. And just yesterday, we had a great one talking about uh, one of the core concepts of the water ski pyramid developed by Marcus, which is the early control transition. Um, a chat that honestly got me so fired up to ski today. <laughs> and, and it, was, it was really, really good. Um, anyway, they have, you know, daily, weekly updates, a huge library of videos, instructionals, writings. They have a discussion board. Um, it's, it's truly a way for, you know, for you to take away a bit of guesswork and get the most of your time on the water. So you can become a member of the Flowpoint Method or you can, you know, first try out uh, the program for three days um, by going to thewaterskipodcast.com slash Flowpoint Method, one word, or you can click in the link in the show notes. By the way, there's also a lot of useful links uh, about this episode uh, in terms of concussions in the show notes. So you can find those in, your, in the app that you're using to listen to this episode. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, I promise I'll be a little bit more timely with my episodes for future weeks. Until then, enjoy. Well, Bruce, welcome <laughs> to the Waterski Podcast. Thank you, Matteo. It's an honor. Wow. Uh, feels weird to hear that, but uh, I'm glad you're happy to be here. Um, look, we, we have a lot that um, we're going to be talking about in this interview, but I honestly don't know your story, so I'd be super curious to hear how did you get involved in water skiing? Well, I knew that was going to be your first question because I've listened to all your interviews. Um, I started, actually my grandfather uh, was the start of water skiing in Manitoba. He went down to Cypress Gardens in the early 1950, 51, and saw them skiing at Cypress Gardens, came back and bought a boat, and he taught my dad, which, who was in college at the time, how to ski. And I came along about four years later, and uh, they were already skiing. And it, we lived across the street from the, the river, and uh, the Selkirk Seals was my home ski club, and I learned to ski when I was four years old. So you said, you know, granddad finds out about, like, looks at it on Cypress Garden, comes home, teaches his son, who's your dad. And how old were you when you put a first pair of skis under your feet? Well, we were, we rode on the surf, we called them a surfboard, which is just a flat board pulled behind the boat. And um, I did that as soon as I could stand up, pretty much a toddler, about two years of age. But I learned to ski when I was four. And uh, my father was a competitor back then and um, kind of got through the provincial level to the national level of, of skiing. And it was pretty new. Most people never saw it before. And our home club, the Selkirk Seals, Put on a lot of ski shows so we were a traveling club that would go around to different places and do ski shows and uh, once i learned how to ski i was um, this i was the small clown in the clown act okay <laughs> and i was the top of the pier i was the top of the pyramid on the five-man pyramid and um, so as i got better and better with my skiing abilities then we started competing I, i've been competing since i was about six or seven okay so competing in show skiing or competing in what we call tournament water skiing no. I'm a three event skier uh, right from the beginning. Okay. And um, my, my strength was, was uh, tricks and jump, mainly jumping. Um, skied in the, my first nationals was in 60, 1965. I should add that 19. Right, right. And um, I made the national team when I was uh, my last year in junior boys. I was an alternate on the Canadian national team in 19, named alternate in 1970, and uh, skied for the uh, Canadian national team. Starting in 71, no, sorry, 1972 at the group championships in Montreal. Wow. And uh, I skied with the three event national team uh, till 1983, so 11 years, five world tournaments, uh, podiumed once, uh, came fourth a few times. At the world and, championships? Uh, retired in 1983. 
Yes. Wow. And that's, that's impressive. What were... Uh, thank you very much. I mean, podium at Worlds? I mean, where was your podium at yeah. Worlds? I was, I was a jump. 1979 Worlds in Toronto. Um, I tied with my ski team teammate, Joel McClintock, uh, in jump. We tied for second, but he had a longer jump in the finals. And back then, it was a combination of the two rounds. All right. And uh, so he got the silver, I got the bronze. Oh. I, don't, I didn't begrudge him on that. He was the world champion that year. Yeah, yeah. Over, overall. Okay, okay. So... Can you, obviously you, you made national team starting from juniors and then continued mm -hmm. down that path, you know, representing your country. Um, yes. What did it mean to you at the time? Was it, you know, the pinnacle? Was it the thing you were skiing for? Yeah, I had idols. Um, when I was really small, um, Joker Osborne was my hero from uh, Cypress Garden. Some of these names you've probably never heard. But um, Brian Muirhead was a Canadian national team member around 65 when my wife was also on the U.S. team. And um, I realized that if Brian Muirhead could make the Canadian national team, then I could too, because he was from my home province. Okay. Uh, we didn't have much contact with the skiers out east, um, but I skied with a generation of uh, George Athens, who was world champion. I uh, was a rookie when he was at his top of his game. And um, then I kind of inherited the team after George retired. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, I always wanted to be a world champion. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that, that doesn't explain it any better, right? I always wanted to be a world champion. Um, yeah. Now, as you, since you said you, you listen to my podcast extensively, you know that I'm very passionate about professional water skiing. Um, yes. I'm somewhat aware of what happened in the 80s and the 90s. I'm not so sure about the 70s and 60s. Like you got to go way back. You got to go way were back. There, um, I was, were there cash price tournaments? Like if you did well, you won yeah. money? I was, uh, I was greatly involved in the early pro tour. Um, I was the skier's representative. And um, we skied in the first pro tour event ever. It was in 1973, Saucier's Cup. David Saucier uh, was a ski manufacturer back then. And promoted a professional tournament in uh, Minneapolis and we went down and skied there it was the first ever cash prize tournament and uh, yeah I won my my small check it covered all my expenses but uh, my wife uh, competed in that event too and she did very well the top prize money I think was thousand dollars for each event and that was a lot of money back then so wow. uh, that was the start of the pro tour and uh, after that we got into different sponsors franzia um we had oh gosh now coors light was yep. sponsoring us for a while the coors pro light tour so we had a little bit of a tour going about six or seven tournaments marine world africa cal cup california cup was in there um we had some tournaments in texas and austin and places like that so we tried to get the tour going and it, it evolved and it grew i mean it I retired in 83, which was just when we were getting our uh, TV sponsorship, uh, the Sports Network. Ted Turner was broadcasting most of ours with the Turner Sports Network, um, and that helped a lot with the skiers getting sponsors yeah. and uh, getting a little bit more cash prize into the tour. And so the tour was pretty active, and I retired in 83. I think the tour kind of picked up through the 80s and early 90s uh, to reach its climax, And then with the internet, things started to fall apart a little bit. The national coverage with our national TV coverage uh, started to fade and everything more online. So um, the tours, from what I understand since I've been out of it for so long, has been having a little bit more difficulty getting established again or maintaining a regular schedule. Yeah. But we had six or seven tours. We came across the pond and we had the uh, British Masters, which was part of the Pro Tour, and the French Masters. Um, so we'd usually travel over to Europe in June, late June, early July, and usually hit those two back to back, the French Masters, U.S. Masters, and then we'd head back home. And, and Australia, I, you know, I'm sorry, I totally forgot, Moomba was uh, also huge. But that was the start of our career. It was uh, invite only. Um, and it was always in our f spring, late winter season in March or April. And um, so I was, that's my one regret is I never received an invitation to the Moomba Masters. Wow. But I skied in the U.S. Masters several times uh, and in the World Championships. Okay. Well, I mean, in, in, according to a lot of the skiers nowadays, too, if you, if you had to put a, 
put up a grand slam of water skiing, that would be it, right? Like Moomba, Masters, US Masters, and World Championships. Yeah, I think so. Those are the top three. Uh, the British Masters is close as, as well as the French Masters. Um, so those three, four tournaments would really round it out. Yeah. The trifecta was the Nationals, Masters, and the Worlds. Right, right. Now, as a skier, right, were you more... I mean, you said you, wanted, you always wanted to be a world champion, but was it a divide? Like, did you feel more... Were you more of a believer, say, of that Pro Tour stuff, or were you more that so somewhat like lateral, I'm aiming at the World Championships? No, we, back then we were always aiming at the World Championships. I mean, the Pro Tour was nice because we could make some money at it. It covered my expenses. Um, I was probably ranked around the fourth or fifth on the Tour. Uh, the top 10 could make their expenses for the year. Um, the top three or four could actually bankroll a bit of money into the savings account but um yeah it, it the pro tour helped me pay for my expenses all summer training uh sponsorships with boats and skis and it gave me enough money for my university education so i had my room and board and paid for my tuition in the winter time so in canada we usually shut down skiing in labor day or in, or in september and so i went to school when i got into university um, we were getting out in April, so I'd head down to California or Florida right away and start training. Um, it was a little rough during, uh, during high school. I had to take a couple weeks off during the winter to try to stay in shape. But um, once I got into college, I was able to do both, maintain a, maintain a um, college education and still ski pro tour throughout the summer. So my, my season basically went from mid-April to just after Labor Day. Wow. It's impressive. I mean, I understand Thank that maybe the, the shortened season might have helped you, com, you know, make the two coincide, but still, what a feat. Because as you know now, collegial water skiing is somewhat the, the, the preferred route to make those two things co-occur, right? Right. And my son went through the collegiate program. Um, he skied for Arizona State. Yep. Uh, go Sun Devils. Um, not and, so much, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know you're from Florida, or you're you're not a Clemson fan. Right? No, I skied for you at Lafayette. You Lafayette, uh, yeah, Bennett's and everybody were really close to us. Um, yeah, bro, my son Brody skied for Arizona State. He won. He put, I think it was silver in the under twenty three World Championships, and then um, yeah, by that time you had to become a full time skier. He graduated under twenty threes into the. It was his choice to go pro and hit the pro tour uh he's a great slalom skier a good jumper um and he decided no i'm going to go with my education and then he went to arizona state he skied college for four years and um then after he uh graduated from arizona state he retired from a competitive ski mm -hmm. i think he coached he coached a couple summers um well he i know he coached uh, summers out in in greece um with ooh, i forget the coach down there he's a famous elderly gentleman I can't remember, but he worked for him for six months, uh, coaching in Greece, and um, then he coached a bit in Canada and the U.S. Okay. Now, yeah, I, I ask you these questions because you know, you, as you as you might be aware of, there are, I would say, f like good efforts to try to bring a pro tour back, and uh, with our sport not really having a shot at making it to the Olympics so far. A lot of skiers and a lot of organizers are putting their eggs into those baskets, right? And trying to say, yeah. Um, yeah. But it, we are in a completely different situation from the one that you were or the one that followed your retirement, right? So yeah. I think there's always a lot to learn from where things started and how skiers were feeling at, around that time. Yeah, and we were, we were really interested in the Olympics at in our career as well. Uh, my wife has two Olympic gold medals. She skied in Munich. Yep. Um, it was a demonstration sport in 72. 72. And um, then in, we got caught with the boycotts in 76 and, and 80 when the U.S. and Russia boycotted each other yep. and they eliminated. We, we thought we were a shoe in for the Olympics because in 76 they were in Montreal and the Canadian Water Ski Federation was huge. We had we needed to do, be a demonstration sport for t two Olympics, and then you'd be accepted. And we thought, well, with Montreal coming up, we're in, and uh, then we'll be in. Um, we got 
all demonstration sports got canceled because of the boycott. No, in Montreal, it was because of expenses. They, they had a huge cost overrun. And they said that's when they built the big Olympic Oval Stadium and the retractable roofs were all coming into play. And they said, we just can't afford this. So they pulled all demonstration sports just for cost because it was too expensive. So we got bumped. Then in, in 80 and 84, that was the U.S.-Russia boycott. So um, we, we didn't get to demonstrate. And by 84, everybody said, oh, we've been trying since 72. So that's 12 years on the Olympic calendar. And everybody said, just forget it. Let's go pro. Because by 84, the pro tour was doing very well. Uh -huh. And so we gave up our efforts to become an Olympic sport. In Canada, we were considered an Olympic sport as far as federal funding goes. Our athletes were getting sponsor or Canadian uh, assistance equal to Olympic sports. So we were a class A competitive water ski team because of our record and our, our rankings in the world. Wow. And I'm assuming that's not the case anymore. Uh, no, can, the Canada still has pretty good funding for our national team and our national athletes. Um, they are still considered equivalents to Olympic athletes, um, but we don't have that prestige of being an Olympic yeah. champion. Well, I mean, that's yeah, that, gold, sounds, that gold medal. Sounds like it's more than what other federations are experiencing, right? And I know that in Canada has been very Canada has been very supportive of the Canadian Water Ski Federation and the ski, and the athletes. So we were getting uh, sponsorships. For, well, the sponsorships we were getting a stipend from the Olympic Committee. Even when I was training, um, back then we were still a class B sport, so we weren't equal to Olympians, but now they were, after the Canadians won the world title team, I went bragging on about our boys, um, then they bumped us up to an, uh, an equivalent to an Olympic, Olympic event. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, no, and I, I, I'm assuming part of it might also be the fact that the Pan Am Games are so huge in the Pan American region, and it is an Olympic event, and water skiing is one of those events in there that certainly helps correct correct which has yeah. always you know uh upset me i'll say that we are in a lot of olympic events just not the olympics we are in the mediterranean correct. games in the asian games in in the panam games just not and the show. and i'm coming to appreciate now more and more being involved at the iwwf level that it's more politics than anything you know that they used to use the boat as an exam as an excuse because it was a uncontrolled variable but with zero off and all the controls on the boat right now the the competition is fairly equitable but you know the interesting cable tow sport towed water sports um cable boarding um has a chance in paris we'll see yeah still does uh i don't know i haven't been kept keeping up with it i heard we were lobbying trying to get it accepted but uh i don't know if it's been scrapped already or not okay yeah i thought it was but not, i I don't yeah. want to be quoted on this. Uh, no, don't take my word for it. <laughs> um, look, I'm going to ask you a bland question. Maybe there is a there is a, uh, an answer or not. But why did you quit in '83? Uh, I had reached my peak. You know, um, I was training and competing and going to school in the winter time, and I realized that '79 was a great shot for me because it was at my home in Toronto, home home hometown. Um, after, after Toronto, which is when I podiumed, um, I tried to continue to train and ski. I, uh, we skied in uh, Sweden, and uh, well, we went back to, we went back to Britain in 80, 81, and then Sweden in eighty three. Eighty one, I got accepted into medical school, and um, I competed in eighty three, but I was on my way down as far as on the ranking lists go. I couldn't do both. I would have had to give up medical school and go full time training. By by the eight by that time, all the Canadians were moving down to Florida right. <laughs> to train year round. You had to become a year round competitor. Uh, back in my day, um, you could do it part time, half and half. Um, but in '83, um, I saw my performances and my rankings start to slip. I was still top ten, but um, it was time to time to step down and give the younger boys a shot. Okay, and I. That was, that was given to me by a friend of mine on the ski team. Um, when I was a junior boy in 1972, I was the alternate on the team. And he stepped down and gave me a spot on the Canadian team for the, my first Pan Am Games in 72. And uh, that was the start of my career. So kind of in honor of him, I stepped down as well. Wow, that's beautiful. And I'm assuming, uh, obviously, you know, me medical school is... It's an understatement to say that it's a huge commitment. So, Incredible. yeah. 
I was I was surprised. I I was surprised I made it to eighty three. It, it got me through two years. My first two years of medical school. Um, my first year, we still. I I just started training at home. I mean, I was skiing in dry suits in in April and uh, training hard all through the summer. And um, the worlds were in me, so I got a good four months in of hard training before the world championships. But as I said, I was it was a, is enough to maintain my levels, but it wasn't enough to improve. Yeah. And as the, everybody else was getting better and better, and I saw myself starting to slip on the rankings, I knew that it was, I was done. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, no, I, I can see that. I mean, you're you're struggling to maintain. Others are moving down south and improving and training three times your time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and the pro tour, you know, the pro tour back then, even if you were pro at the top, I say the top three in the world, they had a decent earning. We're talking six figures, okay. but, uh, the top, the top five to 10 would make, you know, I would make my expenses throughout the summer and it would give me a nice bank account to go to school and pay my room and board through the rest of the year. So I kind of worked year to year pro skiing and, uh, then going to school. But to go beyond that, you know, the, there was not a lot of cash prize at the top of the list. Yeah. Well, it's a tight list. Well, I can tell you, if we could only go back to that, it would already be a huge achievement for someone to to be top 10 in the tour and be able to pay their college education would be insane. Yeah. No, I felt myself, I was very fortunate. And of course, going to school in Canada, education is highly subsidized. Yeah. So medical school in Canada, I mean, I graduated with virtually no debt at all. And um, that made a huge difference in me getting started with my family life and my career. Yeah, of course. Um, what brought you to medicine? Uh, well, I'm four generations medicine. Ah, okay. um, my great great grandfather um, was a doctor in in Muenzo, Zambia, um, with the Boer War, and he was a, he was in um, uh, Muenzo, and he he. Uh, Built a hospital, built a church in Vance. My grandfather was a family doctor. He was the one that started a skiing. He was a country yep. doctor in Canada. My dad became a general surgeon. Um, I didn't go into college thinking I was going into medical school. I have a Bachelor of Physical Education degree. Um, then after that, I took a year off for, from a Toronto 79 Worlds. I worked as a teaching assistant at the university and then trained full-time for Worlds. That was the only time I took six months off and I went down to Florida in January and skied nine straight months to the worlds in Toronto in 79. And, uh, that's how I met my wife. And, uh, then, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah. So sometimes taking, you know, a little bit of time off can help. <laughs> well, I figured that was Toronto was my best shot and I was 23, uh, at the time and near the top of my career. And I said, if I'm ever going to be world champion or podium, it would be Toronto. So uh, I took a half a year off of college. Um, I just took a half a semester and finished at Christmas and then went down to Florida and uh, worked as a ski instructor at Liz Allen's Water Ski School uh, with a fantastic bunch of international athletes. And we had a great time training together. And uh, Liz became our national team coach. And uh, we all went to Toronto, and we came this close to beating the Americans, but yeah, it happened. Not, but it wasn't until the '80s that the Canadian team finally unseated the U.S. team. Yeah, because now it's it's a huge rivalry of worlds, right? I mean, the, those are the two. It's favorites. always been, it's always been uh, the top four: Britain, France, Australia. I have to include Australia. It's the top five: Britain, Britain, France, Australia, Canada, and the U.S. Now. In my career, nobody ever beat the U.S., so we were always fighting for second. Okay. And uh, we, my team, uh, our team won the silver medal three times. Uh, we got beat a couple times, once by France, once by Australia. You know, so the top four, five, four would always shuffle around. But uh, we came really close twice to beating the U.S. Once in in Bogota, when they, I think the U.S. made some mistakes, but we they still won. So yeah, I mean powerhouse. <laughs> yeah they had the skiing they had everything so we, we had uh six months of winter right now strange question but you know skiing as you well know uh back then and now takes a lot of effort right it's an it's a sport that it's short intense you have to travel you have to hang out at the lake waiting for your next set uh there's a lot of um 
I guess, intensity and sacrifice that comes with, you know, taking water skiing seriously. Um, what did any of that translate in, into medical school? Uh, yeah, sacrifice. Right. <laughs> I mean, you, you suffer and sacrifice. Um, yeah, we skied and we skied in dry suits. The water temperature was 37, 38 degrees. Um, we skied in April. We, we trained year round. We were up at six to get on the water before all the other boats came out and destroyed the slalom course. Um, and if you were going to become a, a champion skier, it required commitment, not only from you, but from your, your, the team, whether it's your family or your ski mates, but you, you can't ski by yourself. So, um, yeah, that, that dedication, the commitment, the sacrifice, um, all of that parlays directly into a medical degree because uh, they beat you up in medical school. You know, they you come in there thinking you're the top, well, you are the top one or two percent of your class. You get into medical school and they tear you down. It's like the military. Right. They tear you down before they build you up, you know. Right. So, um, but yeah, it's a very humbling experience. Uh, and it's, um, I said, one of the most difficult things I ever did. But it's doable if you commit to it. Now, what was the most challenging part? Was it the first two or, two or three years where they tear you down? Was it rotations? What, what was the... No, the, the basic science is your first two years. And for me, that's... I mean, I was a fairly good student. It wasn't straight A's, but I, I picked up things fairly quickly. And I had a, a large background in medicine. As I said, I, I grew up a, a doctor's son's grandfather was a doctor. And I lived above the clinic in our house. So... Um, I knew what, what it was about, um, and I had a good experience. I went through physical education. I mean, that was my best pre-med, was not all the sciences that that made me take, but my phys ed degree uh, gave me a better understanding of the human body and the anatomy and the physiology that put me way ahead of my classmates who came through a routine pre-med, which was science and chemistry and physics. Oh, yeah. No, the, I, I'm so thankful for my physical education degree. And because I became an orthopedic surgeon, I, I used that probably more than my pre-med degree. Um, my sciences, um, the phys ed degree was huge. Interesting. Yeah. Now, um, I, there, there's a reason why we connected and, you know, decided to mm -hmm. have a little chat, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Would you, would you want to start that conversation? Like, how did sure. we meet? Well, I, I've... I keep my thumb on the water ski scene and I sort of follow the names on, on the list. And actually I met you at the masters several years ago. I, I live in Georgia about 60 miles away from Callaway. And, um, I met you there. I was impressed with you back then. We had some skier meetings that I would little sit in on and I'd throw my two cents in every now and then. But, uh, we actually met again back in the concussion committee that the IWWF has established. Uh, they've been dealing with issues. I've been, the passionate about this issue for years. I mean, all the way back to my, my beginning years and it stemmed from my father and, and all the health issues. And, um, you were, you were gracious enough to sit on this committee that the IWWF is wanting to establish to create a concussion protocol for toad water sports. Yeah. So that's how we met. Um, what I, I guess one of the, Let's start with the, with the foundation. Like, what is a concussion and why do we care about it? Well, a concussion is a, is a brain injury, usually traumatic. Um, but I don't want to use that word to define it because when you say traumatic brain injury, you automatically shift up a level of injury which results in actual deformity or, or structural damage to the brain. And you've heard of brain bleeds or things like this. A concussion is a brain injury, uh, usually resulting from a hit, or it can be such as from violent shaking. And it interferes with the brain's function. Um, it creates symptoms. Quite common, you say, I got, I got knocked. The Australians like to use the word knocked. See stars, I got a ding. playing, And it happens playing football, uh, hitting your head on cycling. I've been an avid cyclist lately and had a few cushions. But with water skiing, a lot of times it's from impact. And whether it's from the jump or hitting the water on a crash, uh, barefooting, excuse me, barefooting, ski racing, and, and interestingly enough, show skiing is showing a high incidence of, of concussions as well. Yeah. 
So that's what happens to the athlete, and they they develop just a groggy sort of a fuzzy sensation in their brain. They're not quite sure. They're not they're not unconscious. Uh, quite often times they're uh, they're awake. They're talking. They're just a little stunned, confused, maybe seeing stars. And so it's sometimes hard to diagnose the concussion, and uh, you just have to be aware of it of the possibility, and be a little sensitive to it um, as far as a possibility goes. Yeah. And watch for it. Yeah, no, I mean, and I think a lot of people, a lot of skiers might, you know, associate jumping primarily with, with concussions, but uh, but that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, it can happen oh, no, in any abs- Absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. Um, slalom skiing, I've took, taken some harder falls slaloming than I have uh, jumping. I wasn't into the flips with tricks. I stayed mostly spinning and toe turns, step overs and things. But um, I've seen the trick skiers in doing flips, uh, hitting their heads quite hard and the wakeboarders. I mean, they're, they're doing double ups and they're going 15 feet in the air and they're landing on their heads. And that, that impact with the water is significant. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it can happen in almost any discipline. Um, speed has an issue. Of course, jumping, we're picking up to speeds close to 60, 65 miles an hour. Um, but the racers, I mean, the ski racers are going 80, 95 miles an hour, you yeah. know, so, uh, that's, that's a possibility. So in any event, including the, well, the show skiers, they're climbing pyramids. We're throwing girls up in the air. Um, that kind of correlates to the incidence of concussion and cheerleading, you know, the, that's very common as well. So all the sports that we're dealing with are becoming aware of this issue. Uh, it's been known for years in boxing, of course, which is common guys getting hit in the head. And then uh, football has really picked up a lot on it, uh, soccer and those kind of things. So all the Olympic sports are taking a hard look at this concussion issue because some of the brain injury, even though there's no structural damage, there can be permanent functional impairment. You know, the brain stops functioning properly. It's just, it's just not sharp anymore. And so that's a problem when you do get concussions or multiple concussions, and it can, it can carry on for your career or your entire life. Yeah. And it can show up later and on. And then you basically prefaced the question that I had, which is if it's just sometimes to the point where you have a brain injury, but you don't even quite notice it, like mm-hmm. one seem, you know, if you, if you compare the brain to, say, a limb or any other part of your body, if it's, if it's an injury that it's so minor that you don't even notice it, why would you bother, right? But why would you worry about exactly? It? Yeah. But we do know that there are long-term consequences of a concussion, and it, there can be, right? But certainly, yes. they're much more probable with multiple concussions, regardless of the. Symptoms. Yeah, we're starting to look at that, and um, we've been aware of this issue forever. I mean, I personally, am, I'm not bragging by any means, but have suffered multiple concussions in my skiing career. I mean, given my first head concussion was from a diving experience, but um, I've had multiple concussions skiing. I hate to try and count. And I've also graduated into another sport with cycling where I've had multiple concussions on, on cycling. So what happens is once you get one concussion, you become more predisposed to a second or a third concussion. And the more concussions you have, the greater likelihood you're going to have permanent brain problems down the road. And um, the, the thing that really triggered this... And I'm going to go back to my dear friends. Um, back in uh, Canada was promoting helmets in water skiing. Back when my dad was competing. He, they wore old paratroopers helmets yeah. from the military yeah. when they were jumping. Um, the, the Manitoba water skiers started wearing, because of my father, a doctor insisted on protecting your head. We started wearing hockey helmets uh, when we were water skiing and we kind of were laughed at by the rest of Canada. Then when my dad became Canadian president of the Water Ski Association, it became a mandate for all of Canadians to wear helmets when they're skiing jumping. We got laughed at when we went to the Worlds, and now the Worlds is all wearing helmets. Um, but we've been on this, this head injury treadmill for a long time. And sorry to interrupt and, you, but it seems to me that like even going to professional sports in more recent years that started to you know pay attention to concussions and screening... Hockey is one of the earliest examples, right? Exactly. Hockey was slightly different because they were looking at the head trauma. The puck hitting their head was the main thing. But then also concussions are very high in in hockey as well. Now, remember that a helmet doesn't prevent a concussion. So, But we were aware of it. And I 
I probably had 10 concussions and all my cycling concussions were with a helmet on. There is helmet technology that's coming. We'll talk about that later. But what's happened and because of all these concussions, and now I'm in my later years of life, I will say, getting older, um, I'm starting to notice some mental functioning symptoms. But the thing that triggered this was my the, the loss of my dear friend, Andy Mapple. Um, he's the greatest slalom skier of all time, in my opinion. Sorry, Matteo, I know you're good. No, hey, um, hey, hey, like, so, but there's not even, like, don't, don't even <laughs> Andy say Mapple was the Andy Mapple was the goat. And when he died, I think it was about seven years ago, um, I really started digging into this issue of concussions and depression and suicide. And I, I petitioned the Canadian and American Water Ski Associations, uh, pardon me if I use old, phrase, old terms, but I petitioned them for uh, some sort of concussion protocol. And back six years ago, seven years ago, it was nothing but crickets. I mean, nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to touch it. Um, Why? I think they were afraid. You know, they're just worried about the liability, the, the stigma of having concussions or the brain injuries or hurting their athletes and things like that. Um, and it was just becoming apparent in the pro football leagues. So everybody was kind of standing back and, and, and didn't want to touch the topic. And I was, I was disappointed, but I still promoted a lot of concussion uh, education in my talks, in my public talks to the communities and the schools. I was team doctor for the local high schools and things like that here. And we've lost players from multiple concussions by death uh, from second hits and things. And we can talk about that later. But I've been in this concussion issue for probably 10 years now. The, the straw that broke the camel's back was the loss of my dear, dear friend, Craig Llewellyn. Craig was a uh, seven-time world medalist in three-event water skiing as a Canadian. He's, I, I call him the father of wakeboarding. Um, and his death this year, uh, sorry, 2020, um, fired me up again. <laughs> and I just went, hey, this is, this is we got to address this. I was already on the uh, Safe Sport Committee for the World uh, Water Ski Federation. And between Karen McClintock and myself, um, we were able to suggest that we may look at this issue again. And that's when the president asked me to chair the committee and we got together. And again, as you as part of that committee, you're, you're well aware of what happened after that. Yeah. Now, do you think, because I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I was living in the US at the time. I just moved here last year. So I'm trying to recollect some somewhat like the the media attention on concussion and CTE, which then brought more um, you know uh, movement towards trying public awareness, public awareness yeah. and movement from the professional leagues to trying to improve this. Do you think? Because it seems to me that the difference between 2015, when when Andy passed, and, and last year in terms of concussion awareness is is more than five years. It's like an era. Right. So do you think yes. last year the times were more right to tackle this into water skiing? Oh, definitely. I mean, the time since Andy passed away, um, the, the movies have come out, you know, um, um, Concussion, the movie Concussion. Yeah. I forget the, the producer's name of it. That was a great one. And that triggered a lot of the football awareness and, and pushed them into addressing these issues. And um, th- all of the other sports are starting to pick it up too. You know, the, the, the snow skiers, the snow ski jumpers, hockey's starting to recognize it as well. It's coming down into the junior sports levels, the, the children in high school, college. Football is huge, soccer, you know, so the awareness is out there. And now with this loss of Craig Llewelland, um, I think water skiing has finally decided to acknowledge that it exists. And that it could be a problem for our athletes. And we don't want them to suffer any permanent complications or permanent brain problems without knowing the risks involved. And so that's what the committee was, in, was hoping to do. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, this committee, I can testify because I was part of it, has worked quite hard over the last few months um, trying to improve and, like let's say, uh, adjourn the protocol uh, of how t- of what to do should you suspect a concussion, um, mm-hmm. and there's going to be a whole awareness campaign that that we can talk about. 
um, I guess, you know, my listeners are from all sides of water skiing. You know, it could be the competitor like, like you were and I am. It could be someone who skis on a big public lake just for fun. Should they suspect a concussion, right? They see a big fall. What, what is the, the first step? Well, the first step is to try and recognize it. You know, pay attention to what's happening with the skier. I mean, if he falls and hits his head, and if he's stunned a little bit, kind of not moving right away, doesn't answer you right away, looks a little confused, um, there certainly has to, you have to think about it, worry about a concussion. And there is, we've created an app. I don't know, start promoting the protocol, but we've created an app that you can put on your phone at the World Water Ski Federation. That's a, it's a on water. We call it an on, on water recognition tool, and it has a few questions you can ask, look for things, and um, but you can do it by just asking them some simple questions like, "What's the day of the week?" or "What what date is it this month?" or say the months of the calendar backwards. Um, take a hundred and subtract seven, and keep going minus seven, minus seven, minus seven, and see if the brain is functioning well enough to do that. If they don't know what day of the week it is, or Something not so easy like what's your name? Everybody will know that. But uh, what's the day of the week or what's the calendar date? You know, those kind of things. And if they get that wrong or if they're a little confused or dizzy, sometimes the balance is another thing that you can look at and you can look at their eyes. And I don't want to get too technical, but um, ask those questions. And if they're, if they're not getting it, even though they're awake and talking, that means they've had a concussion. And it doesn't, the severity doesn't translate into risk down the road. So minor concussions are just as bad as bigger concussions. And um, that the proper thing is to re- be aware of it, recognize it. And then if you do suspect that a person's getting, being s- sustained a concussion, then enter into the concussion protocol and the brain recovery, which there are phases to go through that you can recover, get back to normal functioning relatively quickly. Yes, it may take a few days or a week. Um, and then after you're back to normal again, then you can go back to resuming competition. But if you treat the concussion properly, uh, your risks down the road for chronic brain injury, chronic traumatic encephalitis or, or side effects, including depression and suicide are much less. Yeah. Yeah. Now, because, and I know we spoke about this quite, quite a fair bit in the, in the committee, but you know, um, water skiing happens on a, let's say a, a tournament, let's stick with a tournament. It happens outside on a big body of water, uh, a little bit different than a football field or anything smaller where you can sort of, you know, be inserted into a protocol right away. Uh, Now at a tournament, thanks to the work we did, hopefully that will start to appear in water ski competitions as well. Um, But I want to go back to the big natural lake, two, two or three friends skiing, something happens. The boat crew suspects a concussion. Go to like seek, you know, medical attention right away. What's the right? Yeah, the, the, well, the proper treatment. Uh, once you suspect a concussion, and I say you can either try some of those simple tests that I I mentioned, or or use the World Federation app with its on water c- concussion recognition tool. And if it's positive, if you think this person's had a concussion. You got to shut them down. Don't let them get back on the water. You know, we back in the old days, you got to get back on that horse and go back over the ramp one more time, so you're not gun shy. Um, don't get back on the bike. Don't get back on the water. Take them to shore. It's probably best if you're not experienced with this, if it's out in public or if it's just family, is take them to get a medical evaluation from a professional, either a medical assistant or a doctor that is used to dealing with concussions. Um, Not all physicians are aware of this or how to manage concussions. And there are various tests that you can apply. One is called the SCAT-5, S-C-A-T-5. That's the most common one. And they'll apply that. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes by a trained professional. And they'll assess your brain function. And there are some physical tests to it as well. And then that helps, helps them confirm the suspicion of a concussion. And then you enter into the treatment plan. And the the treatment plan is, we've laid it out into six phases. But, um, and I don't know if you want to go through all the phases right now, but basically you want to shut down brain stimulation. You want to, we call it cocoon. And I don't like to use that word during the COVID crisis. But you go back into isolation. You know, you shut down your your stimulation. You don't want a lot of of screens times on your 
your phones or your app, your computer screens, TV screens. You want to get some sleep. One of the biggest mistakes is people think, oh, you should wake them up every hour and make sure they're still okay. No, the brain needs to recover. It needs to rest. So you take them out of competition or take them away to a quiet area, dark, calm, let them sleep, get their rest, and um, then see how they respond after that. Um, Loud noises you want to try and avoid. Uh, Driving, certainly. You don't want them off driving or riding your bike back to back to right. home. Um, and then, so once you start that, then you can start to recover the brain function and ask those questions again. As long as they're not having any headaches or nausea or vomiting, anything like that, then, then you can progress on to the next level. And if you're, you're a school-age student, you know, they recommend being off school for a day or two so that you're not getting all that brain stimulation, uh, including reading, um, you just quiet down. Everything should be calm and quiet for your brain. Once you get over that initial one and you're recovered, then you start reintroducing activities at a more and more stressful level. So the first thing would be go, go back to school, just getting that stimulation of all the reading. Then the next st- next phase would be to do light cardio work. So go for a gentle jog or a brisk walk. If you're a skier, maybe just go out and ski on your trick ski or not doing any tricks, but just go for a gentle ride on your ski. And then you start progressing into a more aggressive uh, training program for your whatever event you have, uh, water skiing or whatever, barefooting. And then you would go back to non-contact practice. Um, so football players, they would be a yellow shirt. They can go to practice, but nobody can hit them. Nobody can touch them. Water skiing, it would be something like, oh, you want to go free slalom? That would be good. Um, cutting on your jumpers, maybe some simple tricks without a lot of inversion. And then if you're still doing okay after that, and all of these phases take a day or two to see how your brain responds and any kind of reaction to the brain, if the brain starts to get a little foggy or you're starting to get a little nauseated or something like that, then it's too much activity for the brain and just back up a little bit. Um, But after you're doing the non-contact practice then you go back to full practice, for football players, that would be, you know, equipment, head, uh, shoulder pads and helmet. For a water skier, it'd be start start slaloming again through the course, start practicing your trick sequences maybe, maybe try to do some simple inversions. And then for jumping, you might consider doing some light ride over jumping. Um, I don't know if they still do that, but we used to do that, some of that, single weight cuts. Oh, yeah. And then, um, and then if that all goes well, then you're allowed to go back to full competition. And that can take up to about a week. Um and so if it's a recreational skier, one week out of your, your recreational life isn't that bad. But for a professional athlete, that could be asking, asking a lot. Yeah, yeah. So what I hear is like gradual, right? So once we, we, we suspect there is, we, get, we seek medical attention, testing occurs. If there is, you know, uh, enough evidence to suggest that a concussion has happened, you go into the step-by-step gradual process eventually to go back to the activity. That's correct. The one thing, I, I guess this is a good place to mention this particular statistic. I mean, back in the day, you'd take them back to the sidelines or I'd get back in the boat, dust your head off, put your skis back on and go right over again. Or the coach, and this happened to us at our high school uh, next county over, the athlete got a concussion. He went back to the bench, you know, the smelling salts and all that, and they put him back on the field. Same game. He got hit again unconscious on the field, air lifted out, and he died. Um, if, if you get a second hit, a second concussion within 24 hours of your first concussion, and you're the under, the, under the age of 20 years old, there's a 50% mortality rate. That's, that's the toss of a coin that you will die that's if you get a second hit within 24 hours. So that's the reason you have to shut down. Yeah. And I've seen professional water skiers at Callaway Gardens at the Masters hit the ramp or take a fall, definitely had a concussion, and then this is in the preliminaries, and then six, three hours later, he's back out in the finals and taking that risk of another concussion and a 50-50 chance of dying. And when I tell parents that, especially you know parents that want to get his son back in the game, you know, come on, coach, he's good to go. And I say, okay, you can put him back in the game, but if he gets another concussion, there's a 50-50 chance, a coin toss, he's going to die. And parents go, what? Yeah. You know, and when they start to realize the seriousness of it, 
then they start to pay attention to what we're telling. So what you're saying right there is, to me, the reason why a lot of the efforts that the committee has done is to create education, right? Uh, I think, I think that you said it like more, like the second the, se the parent hears that, goes, are you serious? Okay, out. You can play next we're game. We're dead. I don't mean to be, uh, we're dead serious. I mean, it's yeah. not, not um, yeah. So... And Can you give a few details? Like, I mean, this episode will come out after uh, April 1st, right? That's when the, water ski the World Water Ski Federation will public, publicly share, you know, all the work we've done. Um, what are some of the initiatives from an education standpoint that we've undertaken? Well, the, uh, maybe I'll just do a thumbnail protocol walk through here. The educational process is an awareness program, and we're going to launch a, a multi phased video, um, different athletes promoting this. Um, we're going to do a public awareness on all the websites and the national governing bodies. And then the protocols will be published. Um, the apps will be available. And we're working on all that, getting it finished and ready to launch uh, April 1. Yeah. Um, what we're trying to do here is really get everything in place so that we can apply the, the protocol for this competitive season. I know that we're already past Moomba. And its southern southern hemisphere is sort of winding down, so we decided to go with April one to try and catch it early because we have some pro tournaments coming up in in May uh, that the IWWF is sponsoring, and this protocol will be in place for that. So the walkthrough is you've got to go through an educational process, and the the, the committee has looked at a lot of things, and one of the best we've found so far is called the Parachute Education app, and I encourage everyone to go on their app store and find concussion education and it's made by parachute it's a canadian company canada's done a great job with their protocol and it has an educational package that we are going to require that's require all athletes to sit through and and watch you can do it on your own you have to testify and sign a waiver that i have done this uh, before you can register this upcoming season the educational process talks about awareness talks about recognition, it talks about recovery, and then it talks about tracking. And so um, these are things that we're going to require all our competitors uh, to do in every discipline under the IWWF. Some of them are going to be phased in slightly differently, but that educational process will be required, and we want it to do it annually. So all you competitors out there that are going to participate in a national or international event, get on the website go through the concussion ed protocol with parachute and sign off on it. And that document has got to be received by the IWWF before you can register. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant. And obviously I will have all the links because this will come out after April 1st. So I'll, I'll have all the links to the concussion ed app, the IWWF um, section of the, of the, their website with all the information. That'll be great. Um, I guess, my my hope, you know, like, as you know, I work at a ski school and you have done that as well. And you know that there are some things when you're sitting in the boat that you're looking out for. Uh, clear example, um, you lose your tail on your offside turn in a slalom ski. The first <laughs> thing you're going to make sure is that that athlete didn't, you know, sprain their ankle, the, the binding released. It's so, such an automatic thing for someone who's spotting or watching a slalom skier. My hope is that through the work we've done and the, and the work that lays ahead, that automat automatic thinking will be in place for concussions as well. I hope so. And I think I encourage everybody to download that uh, on water recognition tool, uh, the IWWF. It gives you some things to look for. And if you carry that with you all the time, it's when you, you see it, you know it. You know, we're all sitting there watching, and if somebody goes, oh, that's going to hurt, you <laughs> got to suspect that there's a head injury. Or, you know, they say, they come back from shore and say, he, if they say in the South, just ain't right, bless his heart. Right. And if he, if he just ain't right, that, then he's, he's got to be suspicious for a concussion, and you've got to act on it. Because if you don't act on it, and a second hit comes, again, it can be fatal. But every time you get a concussion, you increase your risks of it, it's more easy to, to sustain another one. So the multiple concussions just start stacking up quicker and quicker. It takes less and less impact 
to receive your third or your fourth or your fifth concussion. So yeah. your brain becomes more susceptible to it. And if that occurs, we're trying to protect our athletes from the long-term side effects, which we talked about is, again, the tra- traumatic com- uh, in chronic traumatic encephalitis and also the post-concussion syndrome, uh, which can come on years later, four or five years after. And that's why Craig and, and, and Andy, they were, they were in their fifties. Did they sustain a lot of concussions in their career? Multiple concussions. And so we're always looking at that and, and trying to recognize that in our athletes, high risks of depression, et cetera. Uh, to try and avoid those complications from multiple concussions because it can be so minor and they're very subtle and they can be missed. Yeah. Now, a, a side conversation, not, not, not really a side conversation, but you mentioned briefly a little bit ago about equipment, right? And how, you know, you can sustain a concussion even with a helmet on. Uh, but what are some of the things, maybe not necessarily in water skiing, maybe we're too small, but in other sports, that have been looked at from an equipment standpoint to try to help and, you know, reduce the risk of a concussion? Well, and I've, I've, talked, I've tried to tap into some resources with uh, some of the top skiers that I'm, I'm familiar with, and I'll name drop a few like Freddy Krueger, yeah. uh, Jar- Jarrett Llewellyn, um, Ryan Dodd, you know, these guys, and I talk to them a lot. I know them well. Um, they've been, they've been experimenting with different types of helmets. The MIPS, M-I-P-S technology is kind of a suspension basket inside your helmet that helps take some of the, the shock out of the, of the, the shaking out of your brain. And that's helping somewhat. Uh, there's another new technology called Coroy technology. And if you think of taking a handful of straws and looking at the end of them, and we're familiar with this in water skiing. We talked about honeycomb aluminum. I don't know if they still use honeycomb they still aluminum. Do. Car- still do. Still do in jumpers. Car- and they ca- it came car- back in trick skis. Yeah. Yeah. So honeycomb, it's a honeycomb of collapsible straw-like material that's inside the helmet, and it helps dissipate some of the energy forces that shake the brain. So that Coroy technology is, is coming along. Water skiing, as far as helmets go, we're not a big enough sport, a big enough market for the, for the consumers to um, affect the manufacturers and do all the research. But certainly football is. We're learning it from snow skiing. We're learning it from other sports. And um, the other technology that we're looking at are collars. Um, we used to call them rodeo collars. Now, in my waning years of men's four jumping, I used to wear a collar. My son wore a collar in college and at the Junior Worlds. Um, I picked it up from Freddy Krueger and some guys like that. And it's to stop that whiplash effect because there is a concussion that can occur just from shaking the brain. You don't have to hit anything. Uh, we know this from the bull riders. And actually, you've watched the rodeo riders have these large collars on to stop their head from getting whipped. Yeah, motocross riders. Bob sledders, motocross, uh, bob sledders. Now, the bob sledders have a shaken brain injury where they're running down the track 20, 30 times a day for training. And it's not when the bobsled falls over and hits the head on the track, it's just the vibrant shaking of the brain as they're going down. And after 20 trips down the, down the course in a day, the bobsled team comes off the, off the, off the hill with, they look like they're punch drunk. Yeah. You know, they're staggering around. They've got the balance issues going on and they're just, their head is just being shaken. So the, the collar we're looking at is a possible assistance in preventing that whiplash uh, type of concussion. Um, other than that, you know, just awareness, and there's some minor technique changes now, things like soccer, the headers that they do for soccer, yeah. hitting the ball, they're trying to prevent those, make some rule changes. But in water, toad water sports, there's not many ways that we can get rid of the water. The water impact is very, uh, hard and, uh, speed is involved, you know, so the velocity that you're traveling at, the features that we have both in wakeboarding uh, wake surfing, uh, the jump is there. Yeah. You got to hit it. Um, so there's not too many rule changes that we can see, but maybe some of the equipment will help. And that's why we're focusing on the other side of the coin, which is the awareness, early recognition, treatment, proper treatment, and hopefully mitigate a lot of those long-term side effects from our, of my athletes. It's not a very common occurrence. We've got some data from the U.S. Water Ski Association um, that shows about 30 years of, of injury reports. And right now, the concussion rate is 
0.2%. Um, so out of a thousand pulls, we may get two concussions. Yeah. Um, and we've that's over all disciplines in the American Water Ski Federation. So um, it's a very small occurrence. We're trying to collect the data this year as far as all the reports that come in and just see how frequent it is for athletes and what is the risk. You know, is it if it's very low, then I think it's something that we can mitigate. But um, we don't know yet. We don't have a lot of good long-term data because it's just not been it's not been studied. And do you think it's also because um, again? Be- because of that culture of ah, uh, just dust off and take another one that we don't have the data, meaning could there, I guess you can make that argument with other injuries as well, but maybe they're just underreported. Absolutely. You know, you just suck it up. You know, well, there's two ways, there's two reasons for being underreported. One of them is it's not recognized. Again, it's so subtle. Number two, come on, you got to be tough, get back on the course, you know, just suck it up and go again. And then the other reason is that, oh, I don't want to tell anybody because that means I can't keep skiing. You try to talk, talk a skier out of training for a week. Are you kidding me? They think they got to train six times a day. Yeah. If they miss a couple pulls in one day, they think they're going to lose it. So to have a skier shut down for a week is tough. And then we've, some of the issues brought up was, well, what does that mean? What are other people going to think? Oh, he's got a concussion. Oh, he's, he's not right. Oh, he's going to lose sponsorship. You know, so there's all kinds of negative connotations to the injury that preclude reporting. Yeah. And I, I, I'm trying to think of ways to incentivize people, to encourage them to talk about it. And maybe it's just making it more, more natural, more, more um, awareness, more common. Oh, you had a concussion too? We're trying to set up a chat room that's kind of sort of a self-help group that can uh, s- s- commiserate together. Oh, you had a concussion. Oh, I know what it's like to sit out for a week. Yeah, you can do it. Oh, it's going to be strong. My sponsor um, didn't care. Don't worry too much about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's a combination of things. But I think overall, the long-term side effects and the loss, uh, any loss is too many. And I've had a few skiers that I that I dearly love that I've lost. Um, people going back as far as Christy Lynn Weir. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She's a U.S. Nat- world champion in the 60s. Um, Andy Mapple, Craig Llewellyn, and I'm sure there's more that I don't know about. But um, one loss is too many. Yeah. And water skiing's fun. Water skiing's my passion. Water skiing gave me my life. Not quite my career, but almost my career. And, uh, but it's not worth, uh, it's not, it's not worth dying for. Oh, no. I'm glad you said it. I'm glad, I'm glad you said it. And the fact that in, <laughs> it needs to be said marks two things in my mind. One, that again, there's not enough education and awareness out there. And two, that it just needed to be said. <laughs> Let's just face it. Well, the stig, the stigma is there. And Matteo, with your PhD in sports psychology, which I really appreciate, you know the attitude of the mental, the brain function of an athlete, you know, yeah. how does he attack his sport, how does he go in training, these guys just go into intense mode, and now it's full time, it's their career, and we're dealing with mental health issues with your help on our committee, um, separation from sport, because some people come off the sport, and if you're punch drunk and don't have good brain function, what do I do then? You know, you have short-term memory loss, you have pseudo-affective bubble disorder, which, you know, emotionality, you have intolerance to agitation and stress, you have short-term memory loss. I mean, these things are some things we want to protect our athletes from. Yeah. No, and, and I think, again, going back to, to, to the awareness, I'm just hoping that you know, uh, as these things roll out, the more athletes that are known in water skiing and wakeboarding are going to start talking about concussions because look what happened in, uh, in, in terms of mental health in professional sports. Athletes started, you know, saying, hey, I've dealt with it. I, I'm dealing with this now. You know, like yeah. it normalizes the conversation so that those who need to seek help are more likely to seek help. And the, it's, the, it's the players associations in professional sports that are bringing awareness to this because after they all retire, and they're still a member of the players association, it's all the retired athletes that are bringing these issues back because they're having these mental problems functioning after they retire from football or from soccer. Um, and I just heard this 
this last couple months that the British Soccer Federation is now looking at seriously looking at this issue. Um, NFL has already done this. The National Hockey League has already done this. Auto racing. I mean, car racing has been aware of this forever, and they've done everything they can to protect their drivers with special chairs, heads controlled. Their their helmets are clipped to their chair yeah. so they're not getting thrown around. Um, so everybody's becoming aware of it, and I think it's kind of come more an accepted topic to discuss. And we're hoping to get online. We're getting on to the different tournament events, uh, showing up, doing little presentations. I put together a, a slideshow presentation for the computer and showing some of the things that is going on um, and just getting getting it out into the community. I hope to present at the Masters, um, different world championships and things like that this coming year so that people can actually see it in, in person and ask questions. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure there'll be good opportunities to do that. Uh, Look, just changing, you know, I just have a question to, to sort of wrap things up. Um, what excites you about water skiing right now? Because, you, you know, like it sounds like you're not skiing that much from what I gather. No, I, I'm not. Um, my boat, I, I have a, I had a 2001 open bow ski nautique, uh -huh. which I gave, I gave to my daughter-in-law as a wedding present. Um, but uh, no, my son skied, I love... I'm just passionate for the sport. It, as I said, it's my family. I grew up with it. It gave me my life, my career. I married my wife. It was Liz Allen. Um, I don't mean to name drop, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, no, I owe everything I am to the sport of water skiing, and I still love it as a passion. I love the people that do it. I still go to the Masters every year. I try to get to some of the world's. Um, I'm skiing when I get a chance to, uh, maybe once or twice a year, uh, like to go out and do a, uh, do a few slalom turns. I went down and actually did some cable skiing and some wakeboarding at, uh, Michael McCormick's, oh, nice. uh, last year. Yeah. So that was fun for me. A new experience. Uh, still trying to master the features. I can hit, hit a six foot ramp, but I can't do that slide. Rail Isn't it the, funny how different that is? <laughs> me too. Totally. Like, it's crazy. Totally they're, different. They're completely I can different. do switchbacks and I can do... 540s and all that stuff, but I and I never could flip. I, um, I my son came up in the flipping era. I just retired at the time, but I said, you know, Brody, you've got to learn to flip, and so I'll have a contest. You and I are going to learn to flip, and whoever flip, whoever flips first, and and um, we tried and self taught, and I tried flipping for about three months, and I never made it. And he finally made the flip, and I said, good, I can quit flipping. <laughs> so I don't have to learn to flip anymore. But well, I love it. I, it's 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 a lifestyle. It's a sport. My son's got a boat on Lake Kiwi, uh, in South Carolina. Um, he's right there with the Clemson people. We built a lake in Illinois. Um, we were one of the early lake builders for competitive water skiing. Um, I helped um, um, Dr. Horton in California. That was the first lake ever. Oh no way! No way! Yeah, Jim. Not the Hortons now. Their dad, dad. Yeah. You know the Doc Doc Horton in the seventies. And then when Jim McCormick dug his first lake, I mean, he he uh, just bought a bulldozer and started pushing dirt around. And I said, if Jim can do it, and I, I had my exposure with uh, Dr. Horton, then I could do it too. So we built our competitive ski lake in Illinois. It's called Lodi. And it's um, we built that in 93. It opened up. So 1993 was one of the earlier ones. And by then, custom lakes were coming around. And it's, it's now, and I hate to say it, it might be a bit of a, detriment to the sport i grew up on public lakes rivers and all that stuff and we had to dodge traffic and and deal with everything like that but uh, the private lakes certainly have improved the skiing tremendously and uh, it's become of a more of a niche but um yeah i don't know it's, there's some good and bad in both yeah i think i, I think you're absolutely right it's something that several guests and i as uh, have discussed over over the months i think though that there's that sense that because water skiing is becoming, at least three event, is becoming more man-made lakes, we have sort of lost touch with the public lake water skiers who are still there. Like The grassroots. The grassroots are still there. And yeah. if there's one of the, the things that I've, I've learned with this podcast, among the many, is that they're still there. Because oh, yeah. it's a lot of the listenership, it's a lot of the emails I receive. Um, actually, you are know... My son's house is on Lake on Lake Kiwi. Walk down to his dock, and there are boats going up and down the lake all the time with recreational skiers, wakeboarders, um, knee boarders still, you know. And uh, so the the enthusiasm's there. We used to be the number one family sport 
the growing sport in the country, in the world. That was our, our claim to fame. Um, and there was a definite loss of interest after a while, but you need your grassroots to be able to support the professional tour. Yeah. And uh, the Cal, you know, I, when I skied at the Masters, we were skiing in front of 15,000 people. And uh, the, the Masters that I've been to in the last five or 10 years, have, there's been, you know, a smattering less than that. So, right. Um, right. Marine World Africa, USA, that was a huge pro tour event. And uh, we had three or four days of competition, uh, 15,000 in attendance every day. The Cal Cup, you know. Well, Bruce, so. I'm going to be at the, at the Masters. I mean, I'm hoping I'll be skiing there, but even if I want, I'll be there <laughs> uh, at the end of May. Uh, and I'm truly hope, I hope I'll see you there. It sounds like you are one of the, com- like the, the committed ones. Uh, We're trying to get there. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can have a beverage and, and have a good chat. That would be fun. Yeah, I like I like to hang out behind the bleachers. That's where all the fun is. Yep. And um, talking to the skiers and uh, just hanging out and meeting meeting old friends again. Look, I I can't wait to see you there. Um, thank Mateo, you. I appreciate everything you've done. I mean, you've really carried the torch through the pro co- pro tour, and continued on with the skiing or ski schools in Italy and stuff. And uh, it's people like you that are going to carry this sport forward. Um, and hopefully we can do it in a safe fashion and enjoy it for many, many years. That's, uh, that's what I'm about. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you.